Okay, so it's 2.10. I will go ahead and get started on our part two of violations, which is meeting with violators and resolving the violation. So again, not all situations are the same, are going to be the same. Um, people are different. And so um, you may end up having to go to court, which would be the ultimate resolution. Um, and that's as far as you can go with your enforcement after you followed all of your administrative um, procedures and everything. So um, we did have a situation where someone was storing material, um, I think it was manufactured homes in their front lawn or the yard area. <clears throat> and the city clerk who was the, ad the floodplain administrator went and just shut the person's water off. And so um, that person ended up coming to City Hall to figure out why their water had been shut off. And um, she asked him to remove all of the stuff. So he did, and then told us about it and was fine with it. And that is the kind of thing that could end up in a lawsuit. Um, <clears throat> so you can't just shut people's water off. Again, we can't go violating their rights. So we have to follow our procedures every time. And, <clears throat> I do have a template for written administrative procedures. So this lays out specifically how things are gonna be enforced. It accompanies your ordinance. It's good for other things like exempting small projects and um, helping guide people through how to get permits if you were out of the office and that kind of thing. And so it's, it's a really useful tool to have and it's more documentation that can back up how you have enforced things and keep you out of trouble. As long as you follow it every time, you're consistent, you treat people exactly the same, um, you're giving them the same amount of time to resolve things. And <clears throat> so all of that, it is a fill in the blank template that you can tailor to your specific uh, community. Because again, there's too many things, too many procedures that cannot fit into your ordinance and really shouldn't be part of it. Um, it should be specific to your community. And so again, we want to stay safe when we're going out to someone's property. Um, I would suggest working with another person, take someone else with you, or you can get a police escort. Um, they're usually happy to send someone with you. <clears throat> um, some months ago, Tara and I were out taking photos of violations and we were on the public street and then someone came up to us and said that we were on their property for some reason, even though we clearly were not. And so it can be kind of a, an intimidating situation and property owners can approach you. People will ask you what you're doing. And so <clears throat> safety first, staying safe is so important. So I wouldn't suggest going out to someone's property, even if you got permission and doing it by yourself. Um, <clears throat> you can if you want to, um, but especially if they're out in a secluded area, um, it can get you know, dangerous. We don't want to put you in danger over a floodplain violation. And so Steve had something similar happen where there was a violation on the Neosho River floodplain area uh, where manufactured homes were being stored. He had sent notice of violation. He agreed to meet with the property owner. He went by himself <clears throat> and that person had promised to remove them. So he went out to the secluded area where this property was kind of out in the country. And then um, when he got there, the property owner had a holster with a revolver in it. And then he was kind of walking him through the property and then got him secluded into a, an area behind uh, the whole violation area. And then um, told him about how his neighbor had shot some teenagers that were trespassing. Um, and so we just don't wanna get in that situation. Again, people might approach you even if you are on the public easement, but in that case, you're at least not doing any actual trespassing. Um, so you might tell them why you're there, tell them who you are. But again, I would suggest working with another person, have someone from your department or another department go with you. Um, you might wanna dress in your either business casual or wear your name tag or your shirt that has your title on it or whatever, just to kind of symbolize your authority a little bit. Um, Steve suggested that as um, it's kind of a small power move that might help um, get you through a situation like this. 
Um, so again, we're following our procedures and hopefully you're meeting with the property owner in your office. That would be the most ideal. Um, so again, if you have to go to the property, take someone with you, be careful, follow your procedures for doing that um, and stay safe. <clears throat> and when you meet with the property owner, hopefully you're in their office, you're in your office, sorry, so that you can discuss solutions and uh, find something that works for everybody. So when you get to that meeting, you want to be professional, <clears throat> turn off your phone, um, don't be late. Um, being late means the person can sit there and they might be <clears throat> upset already about having to come in or having to fix their violation or whatever the case may be. So try to be on time. Um, try to uh, mirror their body language a little bit. So it's... Uh, psychological, I guess, if you mirror someone's body language a little bit, it might enhance your communication. Uh, you don't want to play the blame game because we're not trying to blame anyone or uh, talk down to anyone about their violation. We're really just trying to get things fixed, however that might happen. And so um, you want to get them to buy into the solution. So I have met with a property owner. I was there to help the floodplain administrator talk with the property owner about the different solutions. It was really upset at the time about having to anchor things down or elevate them or dry flood proof them. Um, and so I ended up having done some homework before I went to this meeting. I looked at the LIDAR for their property and found some, some areas that they were working with that could potentially have been um, a good candidate for a LOMA, and so telling them that they could take these areas out of the floodplain, get these sections of property out, and then they could do whatever they want without, um, as far as floodplain violations or regulations went, and that really helped to calm them down, and they were kind of buying into that solution a little bit, um, because again, dry, dry flood proofing is a really expensive technical um, process, and so just trying to find a solution that they can get behind and um, you know, get them um, you know, wanting to take an action that will work for you and for them. Um, so something similar happened when Steve met with a property owner before um, he was explaining why the community participates in the NFIP and about um, you know, protecting life and property, but also providing flood insurance for the entire community. And then the guy, really was into the idea that he was helping the rest of the community and I don't know, being a hero by not getting them kicked out of the NFIP, which is fine. Um, he didn't care, we don't care, whatever we have to do to find a viable solution that's gonna resolve the violation and you know get it permitted or get it removed or whatever the case may be. Um, so you just try to try to work with them and they might not like you and that's okay. Um, again, explaining why the city participates in the program can be helpful to them to help understand why we have to enforce regulations. So insurance, mortgages, uh, grants, all those things might be good to bring up as to why we have to regulate the floodplains. Um, so again, whatever we need to do to find a solution and hopefully you can get a good communication, a good conversation and a good working relationship with that person so that hopefully you can avoid any issues in the future. And we want to explain exactly what needs to happen very specifically. You can do this, you can elevate it, you can uh, get it anchored, or you can do a LOMA. You have looked at the LIDAR around your property, you might be a good candidate. That's gonna require a surveyor and an elevation certificate, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so be very specific. If it's not going well, you can try reflective listening or you can just uh, start out by just sort of repeating key words and phrases back to them to kind of prove that you're listening. So people feel like they're being listened to if you uh, repeat some things back to them and doing whatever you can to try to be sympathetic to their situation. <clears throat> because financial issues do come up a lot. Um, with these issues, it can be expensive to correct a violation and elevate something. So uh, whatever you can do to try to um, you know, ease them into a solution and kind of accept it. And then 
after you meet with them, it's good practice to go ahead and send them a follow-up letter that kind of summarizes everything that you discussed and put a bullet point list in there that spells out exactly what they need to do. <clears throat> and then be sure to thank them for the meeting. <clears throat> be as polite as you can. And then that way no one can claim that you were rude to them. So try to be polite, find a solution, send them a follow-up letter that spells out exactly what you discussed and what they need to do, um, what their options are, all of that. Um, and that way you have more written record about what was agreed to in writing and you have that documentation because again, we have to document everything that we do in our enforcement process. So having all of that in your violation file, <clears throat> So maybe at this point, after we've met with them, we might have a better idea of how this violation happened. Was it on purpose? Was it intentional? Because um, some people just want to build without a permit and then go back and get a permit thinking they might get more leniency or you might just let something about it slide. Some people, again, have no idea that they're in a floodplain and that they would need a permit or that they're doing some kind of maintenance work that they didn't think would need a permit because it's not technically new construction or something like that. So having that perspective might help us with the rest of the process. Again, we talked about doing outreach for permits, making sure people know that they need uh, to get floodplain development permits for anything they do in the floodplain. And that's your local permit and also state permitting or federal permits, if those are applicable. A good permit form should act as a checklist for everything that you need to evaluate as far as those other permits for substantial improvements, um, all of that. So I do have a sample permit and I will just uh, make a note that I will send that out to everyone in my follow-up email. And that way you can take a look at it and see if your permit file might need any additions or adjustments. And so, one way that this can happen is that they have constructed differently from what their approved plans were. Um, sometimes this is intentional and sometimes it's not. So we had an example where we had, I think it was in Northeast Kansas, a small ranch style rectangular house that was being built on a small lot. And so they had the setback and everything was fine. And they were able to develop it to where it was out of the floodplain. And then during construction, um, one of the property owners decided they wanted to reorient the house and kind of change its direction to change the way that the sun would filter through the windows. And so they ended up doing that without a permit. And then the back end of the house was in the floodplain and they didn't have a floodplain development permit. And so they had to start doing enforcement on that. But then they also found out that they were going over a power line easement and so uh, the power company ended up getting involved and then en enforcement uh, over that easement was kind of a catalyst on getting that corrected but again other um, agencies other types of violations can be an ally to you in getting compliance <clears throat> um, site information on the plan can be incorrect or just changed from what uh, it said on the submitted plan um, so it's a good thing to put on your permit that it will be revoked if things are not built to plan. Um, and a lack of doing inspections during construction can also lead to um, having a violation. So another thing that should go in your permit form is when you'll be doing inspections and if they sign on to you doing inspections when they get the permit, they can't really say that you can't or that you were uh, violating their privacy or trespassing or whatever if they sign the permit and it says that you're going to do inspections. So that is another um, part of your permit checklist that can help you out later on and for getting permission to go into private property. Uh, so we had another house that was being built on a fill pad and so ideally you should be doing three inspections. One when the site is staked out, the second one um, and the most important one, if you can only do a couple of them, is to go out when they're putting the lowest floor in. And then you can meet with the surveyor or you can compare it to uh, the staked outside or whatever you need to do to make sure that the lowest floor is going in at the right elevation. Um, because that would be the easiest time to fix it 
is right when the that's being put in obviously before the entire thing is done um, and then a third one when it's near uh, completion and then they recommend doing periodic inspections to make sure that nothing has been modified out of compliance and so um, that's important to do uh, to find the time to schedule it out again if you put that in your written administrative procedures then you have an, a template to follow every time you do this and that way you can schedule it out and you're not treating anyone unfairly or forgetting to do it one time or something like that <clears throat> so uh, doing your part of making sure that people are building to their specified plans. But we had a house being built on a fill, a fill pad and then the surveyor put the stakes out there and then marked the elevation where the lowest floor should be at, like at, the, at least. And then the property owner came out and just kind of drove the stakes into the ground because they didn't want it to be built that high. Um, and then the contractor came out and uh, did all of the construction and the community didn't do an inspection. And so this wasn't discovered until after the completion of construction. And then again, it's gonna be a lot harder to get compliance at that point. And uh, this could have been avoided if we just went on to the inspections before this happened. Um, that is obviously the fault of the property owner, however, but um, kind of doesn't matter we still have to get compliance. And so we wanna look for any deficiencies in the local permit process um, because things can happen and you can think that you're communicating very clearly and openly and then people can just completely misunderstand what you're saying. So they might not understand the requirements. Um, <clears throat> uh, hopefully some other people besides yourself know a little bit about floodplain regulations in your ordinance. Um, so we wouldn't want uh, it to be because staff didn't know about certain regulations. Um, again, putting in the permit form that you have the right to do inspections, especially at the foundation pour, would be another um, good tool for you to have to be able to do these inspections before something happens. And then just put on there that the permit will be revoked if they don't follow the state or the this uh, plans exactly. Um, so again, a sample permit form will be sent out after this, and it should be functioning as a checklist for you to make sure that uh, you have everything that you need and that everything's going to be compliant. Um, also, communication between staff and between departments can cause issues. So communicating is key um, and having this inter-office review process, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit. But if there is a problem with your ordinance or with your permit, then you go ahead and fix the permit, but uh, you may need to amend your ordinance or adopt a new ordinance. Uh, some, communities, some communities in Kansas have really outdated ordinances. So if it's more than 10 years old, we recommend just doing an update to make sure that everything is up to date as far as uh, state law and everything. So if you're not sure about that, uh, get with me. I'd be happy to help you with ordinances or doing an update. Um, so most of the ordinance, at least uh, the ones that are up to date have been approved by the chief engineer. So they shouldn't have any issues with them. Um, but again, the older ones have pretty lightweight enforcement language, so you might want to beef that up a little bit. Um, and so again, communication issues can come up, um, especially with like meaning of certain terms that are technical, like top of the bottom floor. Um, we've had discussions where the floodplain administrator met with the property owner, explained everything that was required in like a pre-application meeting. It wasn't even a violation yet. And then they thought that the top of the bottom floor was the basement ceiling instead of the basement floor. And then they went ahead and built a basement. Um, you know, we're not allowed to build basements in the floodplain, but um, some kind of miscommunication like that can result in a very expensive violation. And then they ended up having to fill in that basement and, uh, you know, go from there. But uh, so explaining what those terms mean, maybe explaining things a couple of different ways, and then again, doing a follow-up uh, to your meeting with all of the specifications written out and what they agreed to, and you're doing inspections and all of that. Um, 
So put it in writing. Again, your inspection process, um, we have to have complete permit applications. So if it's miss missing information, we need to get that information or have them withdraw it and then issue permits in a timely manner. Um, because if it takes you a really long time to review applications, then people might just start building without getting a permit, which again would lead to violations. Um, provide training to staff. So like we're recording this training and we have several other basic trainings that are recorded on our training page. And so hopefully other people in your department or other departments might have a basic understanding of floodplain management or at the very least know that they should be referring people to you. <clears throat> um, and then improving communication between departments. <clears throat> so um, multiple departments might be involved in new construction, like the floodplain administrator and a building inspector might be two different people in two different departments. And so we've had situations where a property owner got a violation notice and their certificate of occupancy on the same day. And so it was really confusing to them. And so we want to make sure that we're doing things consistently and we have that communication between departments and the inter-office sign-off review procedure so that everyone who needs to be involved in permitting and new construction is aware of how that needs to work. Um, so make sure everyone in this process for floodplain permits understands the regulations or um, knows that they should talk to you. Um, again, you can show them our recorded training and so they can watch it on their own time. And that way we avoid deficiencies in communication and knowledge between staff members um, and make sure that people can uh, read or at least use the floodplain maps accurately. Um, we have a state website, Floodplain Viewer. Um, there's a national GIS layer. So I can send, I'm planning on sending those resources out in my follow up letter so that you have those <clears throat> in case other departments might not be familiar with them. Um, they should at least uh, you know, know where to find the websites and have a basic understanding of finding locations in the floodplain. Um, permitting procedures, the inter-office routing and sign-off procedures, um, making sure your violation sections are consistent with each other. Again, our DWR website should be helpful to everyone with the floodplain viewer and our recorded training. Um, we recommend that everyone attends training. Um, I know that a lot of people don't have time for it, but that's where the recordings come in. Um, I can send other basic training resources that would be helpful to people that are not familiar with anything floodplain related. And so just let me know if you need any help with any kind of training. So the applicant really needs to have a clear understanding of what's required for, from them, such as the finished elevation certificate, um, how things need to be elevated at least a foot above the base flood elevation, flood openings, all of that should be very specific in the permit. Again, we want our permit to be a checklist for us and for them as well. Um, and then making sure this process is consistent every time we do it. Again, written procedures are really important. Um, they're not required, but I think they probably should be. And they accompany your ordinance and they explain things very clearly for you and for any potential applicants. Um, so the uh, certificate of occupancy can be something that you withhold until um, you have everything that you need, all of the documentation that you need to make sure that this is compliant after you've done all of your inspections. And this can really work out because sometimes that certificate of occupancy is required for people to get utilities turned on and that kind of thing. So it can help incentivize people to get that documentation to you and prevent violations from happening. Um, Again, it helps to have in-process inspections <laughs> before things are done. And so we wanna make sure that there's no loopholes, our permits are very specific. Uh, we don't wanna have local administration issues. Um, again, we wanna schedule um, inspections so that we're doing them every single time in the same way. <laughs> And if there is administrative issues, if you make a mistake, then just be willing to admit that. Again, with the case where we couldn't find a permit and then it turns out the person did have a permit, but the administration had misfiled it or misplaced it. Um, 
And if you say that in your first uh, violation notice, it gives you a little bit of wiggle room in case you are the one that made a mistake. And that's okay. Just um, you know, apologize to them and get it fixed. Um, ignoring a violation is a really bad idea because uh, it's not likely to go away. It's just likely to get worse. Um, it usually causes bigger problems down the road, um, such as going to court. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, you know, even if you can procrastinate for a while, it's really better to take care of things as soon as you can. Um, so there was one case where um, we had a violation on a property. So I think the house was actually built in violation and it was built in like 2014 and then the property owner sold it in January of 2015. And so the new property owner ended up having to deal with that violation because the floodplain administrator didn't enforce it right away. And we actually have, um, well, the NRDC gives Kansas an F on the scorecard as far as disclosure. We don't have any rules about disclosing um, risks to property or any past flood damage. And so houses can be sold without the new property owner buying that or without them knowing about that. And so um, I do have some information about um, getting around that issue if that becomes a problem. But um, again, another good tool for you to have, <clears throat> and I'll send this out with my follow-up, is the Kansas BFE portal. So if you're in a zone A where there are no BFE data, so you don't have the flood insurance study for that, um, we still require that base flood elevations are developed. And so this is a really good tool for property owners or developers or yourself where you can go in and request a base flood elevation uh, from us. And then we can provide you an official letter that can help um, with solutions like a LOMA. Um, so these letters have been used in support of getting a LOMA. And again, this is another tool that we have to resolve violations if the person is um, eligible for a LOMA by having their lowest adjacent grade above the base flood elevation, um, then they can get out of the floodplain, either a section of property or their structure, and then that will resolve the issue. And that's not a bad way to deal with things. That is a perfectly reasonable way of getting around floodplain violations without really having to do anything, without having to go in and do a major retrofit. So this is something to look into before any major financial decisions are made um, because it's better if we can just save time and money and people like it if you can save them time and money if we can find the right solution um, before they have to go in and do anything expensive. So this is a common issue that we've had uh, with violations on utilities. Um, so on this uh, particular HVAC system, you can see the high water line and so there were a lot of cases and in flood insurance claims where people would have an elevated house, but then leave their utilities outside on the ground. And then it would be subject to flood damage. And then FEMA was paying out a lot of claims on this. And so they ended up uh, making elevation of utilities a requirement. And so it's you know in violation if it's not elevated. And under risk rating 2.0, there's a 5% discount for elevating machinery and equipment. So depending on what kind of structure you have uh, will dictate how high they have to elevate things to get this discount. So if it's a slab on grade, it would have to be to the attic level or higher or the second floor or higher if there's a second floor. For a structure with a basement, it has to be elevated to the height above the basement, the floor above the basement or higher. Um, elevated on an enclosure, um, sorry, elevated without an enclosure would just be on the elevated floor. If there is an enclosure, it would be to the floor above that enclosure or higher. Um, a post a full level enclosure. Um, again, the lowest elevated floor. And then the same thing for a crawl space, it would be on the floor above the crawl space or higher. And so, you know, based on these building types, if they have it at least that high, they can get 5% off on their flood insurance under risk rating 2.0. <clears throat> so for building coverage, we're talking about the HVAC equipment, heat pump, furnace, water heater, 
or any elevator equipment and then contents, it would be clothes washers and dryers and food freezers. Um, and so under the old system, it used to be that if you had your, your utilities on a lower floor, that lower floor could end up changing your whole rating for your policy and make it a lot more expensive. That does not apply anymore under risk rating 2.0. So no one is penalized for not elevating their machinery and equipment uh, in that way as far as flood insurance. And so it's a little bit of a disconnect there, but we can kind of entice them to do these things with the 5% discount. Um, as well as proper flood venting, that can be between three and 27% discount. Um, and then there could be mitigation credit based on their lowest adjacent grade, first floor height, and their foundation type. Um, and so there are lots of factors that go into how a policy is rated under risk rating 2.0, but they do give some of these discounts based on having these um, compliance issues taken care of, such as elevating machinery equipment and the, the flood venting. So <clears throat> that is something that we can use as a tool. Um, it's not as tied into floodplain management as it used to be, but um, we still have some tools. And so I just wanted to include a slide about risk rating 2.0 and what goes into rating a policy, just so you can see, because <clears throat> it used to be excuse me, the lowest floor versus the base flood elevation. And now it's the first floor height, which is a little bit different from the lowest floor elevation. <clears throat> Sorry. And I do have a slide about that. Um, but we have FEMA mapping and data. So it is still a component to risk rating 2.0, but there's all of these other inputs such as federal um, data sources like USACE and USGS catastrophe modeling. Replacement costs, past claims data, um, relative elevation to the flooding source, distance to the flooding source, and many other things. And so this is all part of the risk rating engine. And so if people want to know what their um, flood insurance is going to be like, they're going to have to work with an insurance um, agent. So substantial improvements, um, structures that are improved without being brought to code, so in this case, we have a manufactured home that's about $500. <clears throat> so any $250 improvement is going to be substantial improvement, and then it would have to be brought into code. Um, and this is definitely not in compliance. <clears throat> um, so we do have to sub uh, track substantial improvement on our permit forms. Uh, that should definitely be a line on the form. Um, and so first floor height, I just wanted to go over this quickly. Um, so for, and these are based on the elevation certificate um, building number. So um, slab on grades, it's the first floor, um, elevated with or without an enclosure, or without an enclosure, it's the first elevated floor. <clears throat> and the same thing for diagram six, seven, eight, nine. So the same with a full story partial enclosure or a crawl space, it's the first elevated floor. And so this is what's used for rating um, in the first floor above the basement, that would be the first floor height. So I just wanted to include that because again, insurance has changed quite a bit. And then um, foundation type. So uh, they have kind of consolidated some of the elevation certificate building numbers of into six different types. And so slab on grade is included together. Um, basements are included together and then regular crawl spaces and subgrade crawl spaces are included together. And so um, same thing with a split level. So if it's with a basement, it will be under the basement category and slab on grade would be in the slab on grade category. And so they've kind of um, consolidated the nine different foundation types into six. So I just wanted to um, put that out there. Again, the elevation certificate has not changed so far. Um, but it may end up changing when the next um, edition is released. So the statute of limitations. Uh, most floodplain management uh, violations are a misdemeanor crime, which means it has a five-year statute of limitations. And we had an attorney tell us that every day is a new violation. It's considered a new violation. Um, 
some disagree. Um, so keep it in mind that it should it's about five years and um, different attorneys and judges will tell you different things about it. So um, it just kind of depends on their interpretation of that. But here's where you can see that it must <clears throat> be commenced within five years after it's committed. Um, but it's not a good idea to try to wait the five years out because FEMA may know about it um, and they're, they're still going to want you to fix it no matter what. And then after this point, court is not going to be an option to get it fixed. And so this happened one time where <clears throat> the statute of limitations had um, expired on several houses that were built too low. And then FEMA went and made the community pay for the elevation of those houses because it was their fault for not doing enforcement when they should have. Um, and the city council was not pleased about that. So um, you don't wanna have to go to city council or the board of county commissioners and say that you have to pay to get these houses elevated because you didn't go ahead and do the enforcement within your five-year time limit. <clears throat> so that's um, not a good way to do it. Um, so variances are something that people will ask for. Um, I did talk about having to disclose this information and let people know that they have the right to appeal and apply for a variance in the violation letter. That is true. We do have to tell them that, um, but it's not a tool to deal with violations. That's a very bad idea and it can turn out badly. Um, so being in violation does not meet the specific criteria and justification for a variance. And that's why I put it in my template letter that a violation is not a good reason to get a variance um, because it does have to be justified and have good and sufficient cause. And if you cause your own hardship by creating a violation, then that does not meet the criteria. And so there will be people who say you're just gonna have to give them a variance and they want you to award it to them to resolve a violation that they created. And as we know, it doesn't resolve any insurance uh, premium or insurance requirement issues either. Um, anytime there's a variance granted, we have to give them written notice about the potential of um, insurance premiums to be more expensive. So it kind of does intersect regulations and insurance, even though insurance has changed over the last year. And it's a little bit different um, in how it backs up regulations. This part it has not changed as far as variances. And insurance costs could still be really expensive. And so conditions for a variance, again, they're for people, they're for property, not the person. And anything in the no right, anything in the floodway would still have to have a no-rise certificate, um, not resulting in increased flood heights, no nuisances, no fraud on the public, no extraordinary public expense, and all of these criteria that has to be met in order to be granted one. And so we have to think about first responders that could be put at risk when people need a water rescue and their property is way below the floodplain elevation or whatever the case may be. Um, and so I did mention that we don't have good disclosure laws in Kansas. There are no disclosure laws about flood risk. And so we've had a case where someone sold a manufactured home and then it had um, a markup because it didn't have a permit. And um, you know, that person was notified of the violation and then um, they asked for a variance because of a disability, but we can't grant variances based on someone's disability because again, they're for the people, they're for the buildings, not the people. Um, and so when you, again, create your own violation, that's not a hardship on the use of the property or the structure. Um, and so we get insufficient reasons all the time. Um, property value might decrease, it's inconvenient, um, circumstances on financial return, it might look different than the other properties in the neighborhood if they were to bring it into compliance um, and then hardship created by the owner's own actions. And so um, hardship is the cornerstone of a variance as far as the property. It's not 
something caused by the violator's own actions. So they created this problem. And sometimes um, appeals board will approve things that they shouldn't. <clears throat> so it's really important to have your appeals board know what is required for a variance and have them educated and prepared for this kind of thing. <clears throat> People ask for variances all the time and I've been asked about variances and I don't like them, um, but they do have very specific criteria that they need to meet. Um, and yes, you do have to notify them in writing that it could result in increased premium rates and risks to life and property. And then you have to keep this uh, notification on record indefinitely. Um, so you'd wanna send this certified letter um, and then keep a copy of it, but that's only if it qualifies for a variance. Um, you may wanna send them some swimming equipment in that case if you do approve something that's below the base flood elevation, but we really do have to think about um, you know, first responders and who all were putting at risk and it could put uh, future property owners at risk. <clears throat> so here's an applicant that got um, a little floaty with their variance approval. So variances are recommended for permitting certain things and they're required now for all agricultural structures that are new. Um, or a boathouse, which is a functionally dependent use that has to be located close to water and that kind of thing. Um, but we're not talking about um, non-residential structures or residential structures that still have to meet that criteria. <clears throat> Whereas a functionally dependent use or an agricultural st structure that is low damage potential might already meet that kind of criteria um, inherently. Again, it can make insurance more expensive and we have to keep all this documentation. So you don't wanna try to deal with violations based on variances. It's not a good way to handle it. And FEMA will probably find out about it based on insurance policies and then we'll find out about it because they'll tell us to fix it. So <clears throat> um yeah, variances are not a tool to deal with violations. They are to be given only when they meet the specific criteria that is appropriate to grant them. So we did have a situation where there was a tornado several decades ago. It's been a while where they just let people build back. Um, and so they were all in violation after substantial damage. They were not brought into compliance with the current regulations. <clears throat> and after they realized that was an issue, they were just going to grant variances for everyone and that was not a viable solution. So they weren't able to do that, but if they had, they definitely would have been uh, suspended or put on probation in the NFIP. And so there is a FEMA publication that deals just with variances. And so this would be good to have for your appeals board to make sure that they are educated and informed on what uh, variances should be and can be granted for. Um, appropriately. <clears throat> so variances can um, draw attention to you. It's not a good way to deal with things. They should be very rare. And you do have to have all the documentation that justifies the granting of the variance. Um, and if it's inconsistent with the objectives of floodplain management, then you might um, you know, end up on suspension or probation. So. Um, and if you start doing this, other people will hear about it and then they'll start complaining that you made them enforce a violation or start asking for their own variances as well. And then you're in a slippery slope of granting variances um, and that's not good. So you can find this in the 44 CFR 60.6 .6 on variances and exceptions and definitely be familiar with this section in your own ordinance. A network of spies. So insurance agents submit the policies for flood insurance to FEMA, and then they notify them about variances and any compliance issues. And then um, that kind of information ends up with us. If FEMA is going to ask us about it, and then we'll be asking you about it. So it's not like you can just secretly issue a bunch of variances. I don't think anyone here would do that. Um, I don't think it's um, that much of an issue. It might just be one or two people that 
are really pushing hard for it. And then your appeals board might approve something that shouldn't go through. And I'm not really sure exactly how this relationship between submission of policies and compliance issues works under risk rating 2.0. Um, it's still pretty new. So there are things that we don't know about it yet. But um, yeah, suffice it to say, it's just not a good way to try to resolve things if it doesn't qualify for one. And again, district court is uh, the final step in our um, enforcement procedures. It's not what we want to do, but they have the right to take you to court if a variance is denied and that is written you know, into your ordinance and everything. Um, and so it goes back to their right to appeal and everything. So you might win or lose a court case. Um, and again, some people think if they just ignore it, then it'll go away, you'll go away. Of course, we can't just let a violation go. We have to go the full procedure of getting it in compliance. <clears throat> and so if they're not willing to work with you and correct problems, then you need to be prepared to go to court as the next step. So again, we've been keeping all of our documentation in a, a permit file and a violations file that goes with this property <clears throat> so that we have all of that <clears throat> in case we get to this point. Um, so hopefully you have a good working relationship with your legal staff and you've been keeping good records and documenting thoroughly. So all of the notices, the meetings, all of the pictures that you've taken, everything um, that you have so far. Um, so another thing that happened is the flood, we had a floodplain administrator go on vacation and then the city clerk came in and did an office cleaning day where she threw away an unlabeled box of paper and she didn't know what was in it. And then it turned out that it was all of their floodplain documentation, all of their permit files and everything. So that is not something that you'd want to happen, especially if someone takes you to court. We need all of this documentation. So it should be um, filed away in at least two or three places. So if it's in a filing cabinet, that should be locked. Um, if it's in the cloud, it should be encrypted and it should be backed up in a couple of different places. So um, you want to watch out for personally identifiable information. Um, so private information, that's why it should be locked or en encrypted and then uh, backed up in a couple different places in case something uh, fails. So if you do end up going to court, you're gonna to wanna to have a pre-trial conference with your city attorney and working with them and going through all of the documentation so that they know everything that's going on and what has happened so far. Hopefully you've been keeping them in the loop as you go through the enforcement process. Um, and then again, they're gonna help you pick which of your violations photos are gonna be the best to go with. And you're gonna to wanna to have the entire case um, fresh on your memory and review your notes. So um, we have had issues where it goes to court and I haven't personally dealt with any violations since I've been here the last two and a half years that have gone to court. Um, so it is something rare. Um, so it's not like this is gonna be happening all the time, but we've had attorneys and judges that just were not familiar with floodplain management um, legislation, NFIP legislation or any of that. And so that can cause issues when you go to court. Um, if your testimony doesn't match your written record, so Steve talked about being a juror where the um, policeman had a you know, police report that was part of the um, evidence record and then his testimony didn't match exactly because it had been four months since the whole incident had happened. And then he didn't review his notes before he got there. <clears throat> and so a defense attorney will make a big deal out of any inconsistencies. Um, so you want to make sure that you have the entire thing fresh on your mind, dress appropriately, turn off your phone, all of that. Uh, speak clearly. Um, again, don't use acronyms because people might not know them. People not, might not be familiar with floodplain management at all. Um, and lawyers are gonna try to trick you. Um, make sure that you're looking at the judge or the, the jury if there is one. Um, speak to them as much as you are to the attorney. Um, just try to think before you speak really. Take a moment, you're allowed to review your notes while you're up there. 
of just, um, you know, stay calm, don't make jokes, all of that. Uh, try not to argue or get upset. Uh, just be courteous and complete your testimony and follow all of your documentation. So um, you can ask to have questions repeated. So it can be really stressful. You just want to take your time. Um, and handwritten records can be challenged. So um, if you do have handwritten notes as part of your violations file, make sure that they are legible. And um, because an, an attorney could say that uh, your two looks like a four or your six looks like an eight or something like that, and then try to claim that you're not at the right property or whatever the case may be, um, just remember that anything that is part of this file could be part of the court proceedings. So after everything that you've done, um, if you've lost the case, um, then you do have a couple of other options. So we'll talk about those. Um, we did have a case where a house was rebuilt um, below the base flood elevation after substantial damage and it was four feet below the base flood elevation and people didn't follow up on the violation. The floodplain administrator didn't follow up and then it ended up selling a couple of times. So there was like three different owners in between this time. And then the last person ended up getting a federally backed mortgage. So they were required to get flood insurance and it was really expensive. So they ended up suing everyone, including the community. Um, so that's something that can happen. And then as this uh, court case unfolded, um, the attorney claimed that this was a zoning issue. And so there was no zoning violation, even though we we're talking about a floodplain management violation. And then the judge agreed and they threw the, the case out um, because they didn't understand the difference between floodplain management and um, zoning issues, which I don't really know how that happens, but um, it did. So again, other people might not be familiar with floodplain management. So I'm doing whatever we can to educate these people about the um, ordinances and the regulations that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> but other than that, um, as a last resort, we have the notice on deed and we have the 1316 list. So the 1316 list, I'm not sure if I have a slide on that. Doesn't look like I do. Basically you write, um, you know, you write out justification for why this structure belongs on the 1316 list. And once they get on this list, there is no flood insurance. Um, but the issue with that is that um, a new owner can come in and buy the property and not know about this whole ordeal, the violation or the denial of flood insurance. And if they get a federally backed mortgage, they might end up having to buy private flood insurance or whatever the case may be, it might end up punishing an innocent person. Um, and so that's why uh, Steve liked the notice on deed. So I'm just gonna talk about this a little bit. Um, it's another option um, where it's gonna in inform any future owners about the non-compliant status of the structure um, by recording a notice against the title. So this um, can help you create an economic incentive for the seller to fix the problem because um, while we don't have any disclosure laws in Kansas for a seller to disclose the property's flood risk or um, a violation or past damages to a potential buyer, this is something that will come up um, when they are looking for uh, the title and when they're going through the purchasing procedure, this is something that's gonna actually show up even if they don't uh, get disclosure from the actual seller. So um, yeah, this is something that can help you more than the 1316 list, I think. And so it's here's an example of one non-conforming zoning affidavit. Um, so our position is that if it's legal for zoning, it's pretty much the same legality for floodplain management because um, it's in the same section as the Kansas statutes on zoning. So <clears throat> it makes sense. Um, and this is just a better way to kind of circumvent the non-disclosure issue and get incentive from that person to fix the violation rather than just try to sell it and push it off on another person. 
And so put the legal description on the notice. It needs to match up exactly with the description that's on the deed, uh, the regulation that is violated. So we're going to cite the ordinance again. <clears throat> Uh, the year of adoption of that regulation, specify the map panel and the date of the flood map. Because again, we're talking about a violation in the current floodplain. It's not something that was grandfathered in. And then if they do fix this, then it never goes away. You post a new notice on top of that when the violation has been corrected. And then the new <clears throat> uh, buyer of that property will be able to see it, but it doesn't go away. Um, so yeah. Uh, this can you know, help you get the compliance. And um, again, yeah, you would just uh, put in a secondary notice that says the nonconformance has been resolved. And again, the 1316 list, uh, it's a, so both of these are a last resort. It's not a first step and it usually requires going to court before you can use these methods. Um, so yeah, um, and we have been seeing more private flood insurance companies come in to try to sell to people. So that might be um, something else that happens with 1316, because this is only for federal flood insurance. And another reason why notice on deed might be a better option. Um, but it does, I guess, have some benefits. Again, it can punish the innocent. So you might want to compare and contrast the two. But this will deny them flood insurance or grants, loans, um, disaster assistance, that kind of thing. Um, there are successes, but it can be cumbersome. Um, and there's a lot of bureaucracy involved with this. It can be rescinded. You would just write another uh, justification for why the issue has been resolved and why they should be reinstated and taken off the list. <clears throat> so then they're just taken off the list. And um, you should, Try to talk to people about flood insurance as part of your permitting process. Um, it is a little bit different now. Of course, we have risk rating 2.0 and it has changed the game a little bit. Um, people are dropping their prop their policies more and more as they don't have uh, the mandatory purchase requirement. But um, you know, it is good for them to have flood insurance. Of course, if something happens, then um, it's the best way to recover, more way more so than disaster assistance or um, private assistance from FEMA, and they don't have to pay it back. And there's ICC funding, the increased cost of compliance that can help them come into compliance after flood damage uh, to help them elevate their structure or whatever the case may be. So um, hopefully that's part of your discussion as you're working out solutions to violations. Um, so I'm going to be sending you the follow-up email with all of our resources, but we do have our floodplain management page on our website that has our training videos. Uh, this video might be up later so people can watch it. Our basics course, um, anything else that you want to see in there. Um, <clears throat> FEMA publications and technical bulletins are really good for training staff or yourself. Um, they can help provide a lot of uh, context to how um, the NFIP regulations are applied to things. And yeah, a community official can be held liable for not enforcing an adopted ordinance and for being negligent. Uh, yes. Um, so usually there is a, a liability um, paragraph in your ordinance that will exempt the community from um, being held liable. But um, Again, that's why we're documenting everything and following procedures exactly so that nothing like this is gonna happen. Um, so the Kansas statutes, uh, all, of, all of those, um, I'm gonna send all of this in the follow-up email anyways, but other than that, I um, really appreciate you guys coming to the second part of our um, resolving violations classes and we will take any questions. Yeah, thanks, Cheyenne. So there was one question in the chat from Chuck Chase, and and I think um, you had made a comment about there not being a mandatory purchase requirement with risk rating 2.0, but I think maybe you just misspoke a little bit because um, that is still required for any, um, you know, structures that are in that special flood hazard area. Right. Yeah. No, the mandatory purchase requirement is not going away. That has not changed. Um, I was, I think I just meant to say that people that don't have the mandatory purchase requirement without having a federally backed loan in the special flood hazard area are dropping their policies more. 
Um, yeah, like that. we're see, like the the preferred risk policy is no longer an option. So I think a lot of people are dropping that. Um, yes. yes. Um, but yeah, if anyone uh, wants to come off mute to say anything, um, that would be great. Well done, Cheyenne. That was awesome. Thanks, Chuck. I will be plagiarizing a lot of that in Nebraska. Just want to give you a note. Okay. <laughs> and That's I will. Loud. I will get these uploaded to YouTube, and then we'll get them on our website so that you'll have access there. Hey, Cheyenne and Tara, I, I hate to ask anything because I know that, you know, you're talking about Kansas things and the way you guys do things there might be significantly different than Nebraska. But um, earlier, and I, I'm sorry, this was in the first part of the presentation, you had talked about a stop work order. I know that in Nebraska, we uh, we have to make sure that that's that they give themselves that authority somewhere in their ordinance. If they don't if some village doesn't have it specified that they have the authority to give a stop work order, then they don't have that authority. So we always warn people, make sure that that's somewhere in your village ordinances or your city ordinances or, or something. So you have that ability. Okay. Yeah. I hadn't really heard that before. So I'm going to check out our model ordinance and see if that might be a state issue or um, yeah. if that needs to be in our our new update because that would be you know really good for that to be in there if that's, that's a good point we don't have it in our model ordinance it might be in yours so that's that's good that's good if you have it okay thanks, thanks. okay well if anyone thinks of anything else um you know, after this, then, um, you know, feel free to send me an email. Again, I'll be sending everyone a follow-up email with all of these resources in there. So um, thanks for being with us today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.